What up, guys? It's Chris. Today, I wanted to talk about follow spots and how important they are to a show and how important uh, that skill set is to just being a lighting guy in general. So I feel like it's something that not a lot of people talk about, um, especially younger designers now. I feel like it's all about the console and you know networking and what the console can do and the time code and stuff, but actually being able to call uh, spots for a show is, is an art in itself. So I just kind of want to talk about it, explain... Um, some of the theories behind spot, some of the do's and don'ts, some of the verbiage, kind of, kind of all that stuff uh, included. So everybody knows uh, what a spotlight is. It's a giant light that an operator will grab and hold and point um, all over the place. And for a while, uh, everything was done um, in person. Uh, up in a booth, maybe. Sometimes in rock and roll, you would see truss spots. So uh, spot operators would actually climb up a truss ladder, uh, climb over onto the truss, and then sit in a little aluminum chair and, uh, you know, point the spot all over for the gig. So this is uh, kind of some of the uh, standard spotlights that we would think about, uh, just a big light on a tripod. And we can see here that this is kind of one of the newer, more expensive ones. And you can see that this is one of the newer, less expensive ones. Um, so follow spots can range and they can be anything uh, you want really. I've used Lico's back in my day. I've used Max 700s and just unplugged the pan and tilt motors and then kind of had an operator grab them with some gloves and move them around. Uh, I think another time we built like custom handles for a Mac 2K. And again, we did the same thing. We just unplugged the pan and tilt motor and an operator kind of drove that around. Well, now uh, in 2020 and for the past couple of years, there's kind of a new system. And the two main players are PRG Ground Control and uh, the Robo Spot from Roby. And basically, it's just a moving light, uh, for example, a BMFL uh, with a little camera on it. And an operator will sit somewhere backstage. You'll run like an SDI and a network cable and DMX and everything to a unit like this. And uh, an operator backstage can just drive the spotlight around. And that's kind of been replacing a lot of spotlights that are in kind of weird places. Uh, a lot of truss spots are becoming these now. Um, it's just safer for everybody. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I wanted to include a picture of the Super Trooper. This was kind of the um, the spotlight back in the day for like arenas and sheds and stuff. And I'll throw a couple pictures up on the screen right now. Like I said, this was the uh, spotlight of its day, and it was enormous. This would take up a good amount of your truck uh, if you didn't flip it up. If your truck was uh, high enough for you to flip the cases up on end, you could do that. Um, but this was this was a big boy and as you can see from these cases, you know It would take two or three people just to unlid them sometimes never mind. Go ahead and lift them up on the actual uh, stance So now that we've talked about the different kind of spotlights, let's talk about the particular parts of a spotlight So if we're looking at this picture of the super trooper in front of us, you can see that this uh, front part right here with these little levers that's called the boomerang and I'll throw a couple pictures up on the screen as well. But the boomerang is where the gel frames for the spotlight live. And normally there are six frames. Um, usually frames are numbered one through six with one being the closest to the operator. So it would be this very kind of back one here and then six being the front. Um, some of the other verbiage to know uh, would be the dowser. That would be one of these little levers here, and the dowser is basically uh, your intensity. Sometimes it's undesirable for the spotlights to be on full, especially if the spotlight is a little too big for the room per se, or um, your scene might not be as bright, or you might want to go for a mood type thing. You can always go down in intensity, and that's what the dowser will allow you to do. One of these other levels uh sorry one of these other little knobbies here is a going to be the iris that will control the size of your circle that you are spotting 
So you can also put an iris and a leco in the accessory slot, and again, that'll do the same thing. It'll just kind of make the whole um, the beam of light that you're shooting down either kind of bigger or smaller. Usually smaller is the case. And then I believe um, this other knob at the top here is going to be the um, focus. So whether you have a sharp edge or a soft edge. These knobs down here are going to be, you know, kind of the drag and all that stuff, whether you want it to be like a heavy drag or if you want it to be kind of, you know, super light as you're moving the spotlight around. And uh, actually, I think I'm I think I lied. One of these is not the focus. I believe this knob or sorry, this red slider right here would be the focus. So now that we know about all the parts of the spotlight, let's talk about some of the gel choices that one might put in a spotlight. Now, depending on the show, whether you're lighting for theater or rock and roll or dance or, or anything like that, normally a spotlight is going to be used to light a person. So, depending on the source of the lamp, that's very important to know, uh, will kind of determine your color temperature that comes out the lamp. Uh, a lot of these lamps are, are xenon lamps or they're high wattage uh, arc lamps of some sort. So those, they'll tend to have a higher color temperature than not. So what I like to do is I like to put CTO in frames one and two. And believe if I remember correctly, 206, uh, 204 is going to be full CTO, 205 will be half CTO, and 206 will be a quarter CTO. Um, sometimes what I like to do is I like to put one cut of 205 in frame one, two cuts of 206 behind that, and then one cut of uh, eighth minus green. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So these are kind of some of the levels of CTO that you might want to use to warm up the spotlight as it will be a kind of colder, whiter source. Um, and just while we're talking about CTO, I wanted to bring up CTB, which will do the exact opposite. That will bring the color temperature up. Um, so, for example, if you were using a Source 4 PAR and wanted to match a uh, moving light uh, source, you would put some CTB in it. And again, uh, 201 would be full, CTO, uh, full CTB, uh, 202 would be half CTB, and uh, 203 would be a quarter. So moving on to 8th minus green, um, talking about the spotlight lamps, sometimes, you know, we're talking about them being colder and whiter and with a little bit of blue. Sometimes over time they can get this green tint to them. Uh, some of the older lamps will just kind of turn green in the slightest. And if you're not using color correction, it can make your performer look sick. And that is definitely not desirable. So sometimes, in conjunction with a CTO, you might add an eighth minus green. Now, it looks pink, which it is, but you got to remember, you know, gel is subtractive lighting, so this will pass everything but that green color. It'll pass the red and the blue through. Uh, it'll pass everything but that green color. So that kind of helps um, whiten up the light and, and kind of get rid of that green, obviously, eighth minus green. And uh, you can do a quarter minus green. You can do a half minus green, I believe. I think those are just um, two numbers up from this. One of the last verbiage things I'll talk about is uh, when you're actually calling the show, you need to specify whether you want them to fit, whether you want the spotlights to fade in or you want them to snap in. And what that usually means is a fade in will be about a three second kind of fade, you know, for the light up. Or you can um, tell them how long you want it. You would do a five second fade, a two second fade. And a snap will kind of be uh, a zero count, you know, a very quick on kind of a bump type look or a uh, Sometimes people call it bumps or, you know, bump on, bump off, or snap on, snap off. Um, these are just some common common words that the spot operators uh, should know. And that's important when you go to do your spot meeting. So usually right before the show, um, sometimes you can do this off-com depending on if your show is big enough. 
I tend to do it on com because the show that I'm running at the moment is relatively simple. Um, but the spot meeting is a very important part of your show. You need to assign your spot operators uh, numbers. For example, uh, the show that I'm using has three spots, and I have designated house left spot one, center of spot two, house right of spot three. Um, you can number them however you want. That's what works for me. And we also start in frame one. So I will tell the spots, all right, spots, this, this is your, these are your numbers. We're going to start in frame one, which for me is 205, I think, which is CTO. We're going to start at 50% intensity, full body shot, which is uh, exactly what it sounds like. The whole, per the whole person is in the light. Um, that's opposed to a three-quarter shot, which would be the knees up, a waist up, which is the waist up, or a head only. Um, those shots are more common in theater and kind of more precise things like that where you might just need to highlight a head or, uh, you know, certain things like that for rock and roll and comedy and things like that. I tend to just use a full body shot as it's more kind of about the artist than um, not, especially when you're lighting for video. It's, it's, it's a big deal then. So after the spotlights have their assigned number, they know what frame they're starting at, they know kind of what size and the intensity, um, then I'll kind of give them a quick rundown of the show, you know, if there's an intermission or not, you know, I expect them back on comm five minutes before, you know, act two, kind of this and the other thing, we'll do a comm check, um, but yeah, I usually just try to kind of give them as much information as I can. I try to speak clearly. I try to keep my calm uh, headset up as loud as possible. I don't really care if I'm being too loud because it's loud for me at front of house and I need to make sure people hear my calls. So now that the spots know what they're doing and we're going to front of house, we're finally going to do the show. Um, it's important that you give everybody on calm uh, house lights, spots, everybody on calm. Um, any updates that you get from production, you know, as far as if we're going on time, if we're going to hold five minutes, things of that nature. So once you're finally in the show and you call house lights and things go to black, the most important thing to do is, uh, give standbys is give good standbys and good clear goes for spots. Um, the show that I'm doing, there's three comics, couple intros, couple intro videos of that nature. So, you know, I will call standby for comic one, standing by, and spots go. That's what spots want to hear. Um, that's what stagehands want to hear. You know, they want to hear a clear go from the person driving the boat, which should be you if you're listening to this video. Try not to give too long a standbys. You don't want to give a standby and then not have the, the go for another two minutes or so. Um, but you don't want to have it standby and then go. You want to give, you know, a fair amount of time for, you know, the operator to get ready to go. Uh, as long as you're clear and respectful on calm, the spotlight should, you know, the spot ops should give you a great show. Um, most of the union guys are professional, you know, However, um, however, the follow sp the spotlight job is kind of the newbie position for a lot of roadhouses, for a lot of venues in general. So don't get frustrated if there's a newer person on um, the spots. Just kind of talk them through it. You know, sure things get frustrated on the road, this, that, and the other thing. But you know, you catch more bees with honey than you do uh, vinegar, and it's just never good to get mad on calm or anything like that or get all pissed off because those guys will fucking find you and god forbid you have to load out afterwards with them <laughs> one of the great things about ma2 is there's a notes section in your cue list file and i'll put a picture up on the screen of my cue list for the show that i'm running now but in my notes you can see that i've written little spot notes and you know, if you're just learning a show or if you're passing a show off to another operator, that's one of the best things that you can do is label your show. I mean, that's like, you know, MA2 Basics 101. It's just label every single thing that you may have a preset that you make, everything like that. However, the notes section in the cue list is incredible for spot notes. Um, if there's a scenic move, if there's anything else you have to call during the show, you can just put it in the notes right here. Um, so that's it. 
that's all I'll say about spots. Um, just be as clear as you can. Double check everything. You know, make sure if you're uh, traveling around, you you carry enough spare gel. Um, you know, you would think that Spotlight gel is a certain size all around, but it's not. Some of them are this big. Some of them are this big. Um, just make sure you carry around enough gel with you if you're on the road. Always have a backup. You know, never do a gig with just one spotlight if you can avoid it. You know, I know some venues are tough. So there's budget restrictions, this and the other thing, but it's always good to have a backup of that. Um, so, yeah, hope this video was helpful to people, uh, to LDs, you know, learning the craft. And this is not something to overlook. This is something, not that will make or break your career, but this is something that will kind of solidify you moving forward in the uh, career of lighting.